Welcome to Military HF Radio, Episode 1, Radio Frequency Theory. I'm your host, Matthew Sherburn, KF4WZB. We have nine episodes to cover, so today we'll be covering Episode 1. Each episode is going to touch base with the previous episode and build upon previous concepts. So make sure to like and subscribe so that you can keep continuing your education into Military HF Radio. The agenda for today, the Federal Communications Commission Amateur Radio Licensure, Army Doctrine and Training Overview, Radio Communications, Wave Propagation, Propagation Paths, and then finally, Solar Activity Effects on Communications. So, FCC Amateur Radio Licensing, why? We all need to be technical leaders in our organizations, whether it's being a soldier, NCO, or officer. Getting your amateur radio license allows you to apply your radio skills in what is, some people see it as a hobby, but it's also a professional organization. It's outside of the military. It's a place where you can just grow and learn with others. You become a member of a worldwide professional organization. The Amateur Radio Relay League is the National Association for the United States. Other countries have amateur radio in their own versions of the Amateur Radio Relay League. All of that knowledge that you're getting in your professional military courses in radio, you can now test and validate. The FCC charters amateur radio to do a number of tasks, but one of those is to advance the art and science of radio communications. The amateur radio license is to a 25 uniform, which in the US Army, the military occupational specialty of radio telephone operator, that is to getting your net plus or security plus for 25 bravo which is our automations soldiers so testing classes are offered closer to you than you think and you can find a class or an exam by looking at either of those two urls there are numerous amateur radio clubs hosting classes and exams near military bases or if you're a national guardsman or reservist that during your day job you're not really near an actual base, they're everywhere. So please give that a look. Now, finally, U.S. Army Doctrine and Training. Every service has their own versions of their doctrine for HF radio and and tactical radio operations, but here I'm just going to talk about the Army. And you can actually access a fair majority of our doctrine through HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash armypubs.army.mil through the Publications tab. Let me bring that up real quick for you. If you click on the publications tab and go down to doctrine and training, you can look at the whole host of various types of doctrine. And so with that, I'll show you the at least the two critical ones that will assist you. So ADP, the Army Doctrine Publication 6-0 for Mission Command, published on May 2012. ADPs are kind of like your executive summaries in this case of each of the warfighting functions. Mission Command is a warfighting function for the other sister services it's known as command and control Uh, there is some debate on whether or not mission command should be considered a philosophy and not a function but we shall see if it goes back to command and control for the army in the future nest under the that is a little bit more text into mission command in the form of army doctrine reference publication 6-0 and nested under that is Field Manual 6-02, Signal Support to Operations, from January 2014. Back in the day, a couple of decades ago, the field manuals used to be chock full of technical data. And the Army has elected to push that technical data further down into Army Techniques Publications, Technical Manuals, Technical Bulletins, and Training Circulars. So some people will see these field manuals and say, oh my gosh, the Army's lost it all. Where did it all go? I will tell you right now, it's found in Army Techniques Publication 6-02.53, Techniques for Tactical Radio Operations from January 2016, fairly recent. You can access that, anybody can, through that website I just said. There's a whole host of other ATPs and some TMs and some technical bulletins, but I would not worry about those. But the last one, absolutely. TC, or Training Circular 9-64, the Communications Electronics Fundamentals, Wave Propagation, Transmission Lines, and Antennas from July 2004. Absolutely access that as well. 
fact, most of this episode is based on TC 9-64. That's where the Army took everything from the field manual, put it into this document right here. You study that, folks that are not amateur radio operators, you study this, and you're already well on your way to getting your technician class license. I'll tell you that right now. So, ATP 6-02.53, TC 9-64. Download that and read that at your leisure. So let's start off, radio communication systems. Pretty intuitive, you have a transmitting station whose energy is transmitted through a transmission line to an antenna, which then radiates the radio frequency energy through some medium, and then received by a receive antenna that then couples that energy through the antenna into the transmission line and into your receiving station. Your ability to work radio is based on five factors. Your skill as a radio operator and planner. And yes, officers, you do need to have some degree of technical experience with HF radio in order to effectively plan. So get on that. Your equipment and how to use it. Antennas, tuners, amps, power supplies. Understanding radio wave propagation. The antennas that you use. And then finally, the frequency range you select. I cannot stress enough antennas and frequency. Radio waves, frequency and wavelength. Here we have a wave, and on our x-axis, it is in terms of time, and then our amplitude here, defined as the height of a wave crest above a reference line, and indicates the size or magnitude of a wave or current. We have a cycle, which is the combination of one complete positive and negative alternation of an alternating wave. We would say that there is one complete cycle from crest to crest, or it could do trough to trough. It just has to be the same reference point. Wavelength. The distance in space occupied by one cycle of a radio wave for a given period of time expressed in meters and then represented by the Greek symbol lambda. Frequency, which most people normally work with, is the number of cycles completed in one second and expressed in hertz after Heinrich Hertz. So when you use units for frequency, always make sure to capitalize the H in honor of Heinrich Hertz. It shares an inverse relationship with wavelength. So as frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. So within one second, you increase the number of cycles, but in order to increase the number of cycles within that same one second period, you've got to shrink the distance between the crests or the troughs. Now, there's something else that is involved in wavelength and frequency relationship. That is that wavelength is equal to 300 divided by the frequency with the frequency being represented in megahertz. So what's this 300? Well, it turns out that what relates everything to itself and each other is the speed. In this case, radio frequency waves move at the speed of light. So what is the speed of light? Well, it's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So in order to not have to deal uh, with such large numbers, we just say that we have 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz, and we effectively divide out 10 to the six. This makes it easier for soldiers that are in the field trying to calculate what length of antenna they need. Again, the, the most effective antenna is one that is matched to the wavelength of the frequency you're operating on. And so if you know that you're operating on 3.8 megahertz, for instance, then you would take 300 divided by 3.8, and that gives you the length in meters that that antenna should be for a full wavelength antenna. Wave propagation, so the medium. This is the vehicle through which the wave travels from one point to the next. Propagation means movement through a medium. Just as the rays spread out from the bulb of a lamp or the beam from a flashlight, in this case, this flashlight represents a directional, focused nature of the light, the, the light in the lamp, where the radio is way, may spread out in all directions, would represent an omnidirectional uh, antenna. So again, that just depends on how the antenna is constructed, whether or not it's omnidirectional or if it's a directional. But here's to show you in terms of light. Components of the electromagnetic wave. This, this wave is the radio frequency energy that your system is radiating. So what does it consist of? You have an electric field or an E field, which results from the force of voltage, potential difference. 
then a magnetic field, the H field, results from the flow of current. The E and H fields are at right angles to each other and determine the polarization of the wave, created whenever an electric current passes through a wire, which is what your radio is doing. Radio systems that have cross polarization greatly reduce signal power. The electromagnetic field is used to transfer energy as communications from point to point. <clears throat> An antenna is a propagation source of these electromagnetic waves. So let's look at the first type of polarization known as vertical polarization. The polarization itself is determined by the E plane. So we have vertical antennas on either side of the system and we see that vertical polarization is perpendicular to the Earth's surface. <clears throat> you mainly see vertical antennas and those vertical whip antennas on tops of vehicles. So then we have also horizontal polarization in which the antennas are parallel to the Earth's surface. And you mainly see those uh, if you're looking at tops of homes that may have TV antennas, those are horizontally polarized. Or more specifically, those antennas are called Yagi Uda antennas. And those are ones that ham radio operators specially use uh, for their operations on HF to direct the energy in, into a particular direction. Now, what happens if we have a vertically polarized transmitting antenna, like you see on the top left, but then received by a horizontally polarized receiving antenna. Well, what you're going to have is almost minimal coupling of the E-plane, the, the electric uh, lines of force, by that receiving antenna, in which case you will barely get any signal. So it's absolutely imperative that on both ends of your radio system that you're keeping and maintaining the same polarization of antennas. Propagation paths. You have, can have a direct wave which it travels directly from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna. We see this mainly in line of sight of antennas. It's limited by the distance to the horizon or line of sight. With that said, the antenna height and curvature of the earth are also limiting factors. Radio horizon, which is actually a thing, is about 80% greater than the line of sight because of diffraction effects. In fact, the wave front as it moves towards the edge of that horizon will end up bending the, the, the front of that wave down and around, if you want to call it that, over the curvature of the Earth, but just for a little bit longer before it attenuates to the point where there's almost no signal left. Surface wave reaches the receiving site by traveling along the surface of the ground. A surface wave follows the contours of the Earth due to diffraction. Terrain affects propagation, so let's take a look at that. Salt water has very good connectivity, all the way down to jungle, very poor. And you're like, oh wow, jungle has a really moist environment with lots of vegetation. But it's because of that that causes these direct waves to attenuate heavily. And you know this if you've ever been in the woods, not just the jungle, but just any woods, and you're trying to transmit, let's say on your VHF Singar's radio, you're not going that far. Why? Those radio waves are getting heavily attenuated, absorbed by the trees. So something to think about. Ground reflected wave. When they're reflected from the Earth's surface, the reflected wave undergoes a phase reversal of 180 degrees. And we're going to talk about this because this can have and result in fading uh, due to destructive interference between having a one signal that comes in, as you see there, a direct wave uh, in phase, and then you've got this ground reflected wave going in a phase reversal. And once those two signals match up at the receiver, they can actually either help each other or actually destruct the signal to the point where the receiving antenna gets a deep fade. More on ground wave propagation. So again, with the antenna, with ground wave propagation, increased antenna height increases distance. Vertical polarization is best for ground wave propagation. If you increase transmitter power it can increase distance but not proportionately that you think about meaning that if you are operating 20 watts that gets you about five miles that if you have a two times increase in power that's going to you a two times increase in distance that's not the case so you just need to understand that better ground connectivity increases distance there's less noise during daytime there's less bandwidth 
leads to increased distance of your signal. Meaning if you use a modulation scheme that uses less bandwidth to operate on, then you can potentially get a uh, increase in distance. So best way to describe this, if you know Morse code, very minimal bandwidth versus using your voice to communicate with, that takes a lot more bandwidth to get that message across that Morse code will go and travel a further distance. Obstacles such as intervening trees will decrease distance. Skyway propagation. This is the bread and butter of HF communications right here. Skyway propagation is refraction of a radio wave by ionosphere, and that is the sole property of a sky wave right there. And that's what allows you to achieve long and intermediate range. So let's look at the layers of the atmosphere. A little quick lesson, if you did not know this, here you go. So the Earth's atmosphere is divided into three separate regions or layers. They are the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the ionosphere. The layers of the atmosphere are illustrated in this figure, 2-10. The troposphere is the portion of the Earth's atmosphere that extends from the surface of the Earth to a height of you know, about 6 kilometers at the North Pole or the South Pole and about 18 kilometers at the equator. Virtually all weather phenomena take place in the troposphere. The temperature in the, this region decreases rapidly with altitude and when clouds form and there may be much turbulence because of variations in temperature, density, and pressure. These conditions have great effect on the propagation of radio waves. The stratosphere is located between the troposphere and the ionosphere. The temperature throughout this region is considered to be almost constant and there is little water vapor present. The stratosphere has relatively little effect on radio waves because it is a relatively calm region with little or no temperature changes. And finally, the ionosphere extends upward from about 50 kilometers to a height of about 400 kilometers. It contains four cloud-like layers of electrically charged ions, which enable radio waves to be propagated to great distances around the Earth. This is the most important region of the atmosphere for long-distance point-to-point communications. And as a fun fact, the International Space Station has an orbit height of about 225 miles, so it's at the very upper end of the ionosphere in low Earth orbit. So let's look more specifically at the regions of the ionosphere because this is where all the HF magic happens. So we have four layers and we'll start off with the D layer, which is the closest to the Earth's surface. D layer ranges from about 30 to 55 miles. The ionization in the D layer is low because it is the lowest region of the ionosphere. This layer has the ability to refract signals of low frequencies. High frequencies pass right through it and are attenuated. After sunset, the D layer disappears because of the rapid recombination of ions. The next layer up, the E layer, limits are from about 55 to 85 miles. This layer is also known as the Kennelly Heaviside layer because these two men were the first to propose its existence. The rate of ionic recombination in this layer is rather rapid after sunset and the layer is almost gone by midnight. This layer has the ability to refract signals as high as 20 megahertz. For this reason, it is valuable for communications in ranges of up to 1,500 miles. The F layer exists from about 85 to 250 miles. During the daylight hours, the F layer separates into two layers, the F1 and F2 layers. The ionization level in these layers is quite high and varies widely during the day. At noon, this portion of the atmosphere is closest to the sun and the degree of ionization is maximum. Because the atmosphere is rarefied at these heights, recombination occurs slowly after sunset. Therefore, a fairly constant ionized layer is always present, both day and night. The F layer are also responsible for high frequency, long distance transmission. Now let's talk about propagation, hops, and skip zones. So we have a transmitting station in San Francisco, which has both ground wave propagation going up to some point, and then depending on takeoff angles of the signal, can either skip out of the ionosphere or be able to reach another point. Let's say it skips completely over Denver for that particular frequency. And then another uh, skip happens off to Chicago and so on and so forth. 
The thing is, is that there is actually no skip zone as long as you have the proper antenna and frequency selected. You're the actual person that's causing the skip zone because you're on a particular frequency that so happens to have to skip over that city or that area. And so we can get it so that you can get a almost near vertical incident takeoff angle that allows the communication to, let's say, go out up to Denver from San Francisco. That's actually kind of a stretch, but let's just go with it. And you could have the ground waves take care of out to a certain point, and then the signal come back down on, let's say, Denver, in which case you would eliminate a skip zone. Um, there can be instances in which you have destructive interference or fading because the signal, by sending it so high directly up and coming almost back down, particularly in the same regions where your ground waves are propagating out to, that they can um, mix with each other and destruct. And we'll talk about that in another slide. How you mitigate that? Well, you can use special Nivis antennas to hopefully mitigate that issue. You go over some propagation terms. So we have the maximum usable frequency, lowest usable frequency, and the optimum working frequency. So maximum usable frequency varies from day to day. They can typically use sounding to see what is the, the maximum frequency for that area out to some distance that, that will work. However, by its definition though, that is where it would be available 50% of the time. The lowest usable frequency, which is as far low as you can go before the, uh, the ionosphere ends up absorbing the signal instead of refracting it, that's also good for 50% of the time. So you never want to tell your commander, sir or ma'am, we're going to go with maximum usable frequency, but it's going to work about 50% of the time. No. So we have what's called the optimum working frequency. Now, the acronym is actually FOT, and some people incorrectly say that that is the frequency of optimum transmission, but it's actually the optimum working frequency. It's just that in French, it is the frequence optimum de travel. That is what it's based off of. Now you know. This is the highest frequency at which the ionospheric propagation between two locations is available 90% of the time. That your commander can go with. So where is the optimum working frequency with relation or in relation to the maximum usable frequency? It happens to be 15 to about 25% below the maximum usable frequency. Propagation data is affected by the time of year, day, and solar activity. So you just have to keep that in mind. However, I have spoke to some operators that have experienced situations in which their calculated maximum usable frequency happen to mean that their frequency of, or their optimum working frequency was actually above that. So basically when you are running calculations and we're gonna have a whole episode on VOA cap analysis, you go to the spectrum manager, you tell them you need frequencies both below and above the maximum usable frequency, just so that you have some room to experiment with. Atmospheric propagation, we're gonna talk about reflection, refraction, diffraction, and then finally absorption. So reflection. Reflection for HF signals happens at the Earth's surface. Radio waves may be reflected from substances or objects they encounter during travel between the transmitting and receiving sites in particular. It can cause phase shift between direct wave and the reflective wave resulting in distortion or cancellation. We talked about that in the earlier slide. And then the amount of reflection depends on the reflecting material. Is it coming in contact with uh, the ground? Is it coming in contact with a desert? Is it coming in contact with an ocean or a fresh body water? So let's look at this. We have here a light. Let's just say it's a laser to make this easier. And you're shining that laser at a reflecting surface. Let's say a mirror. Well, we have the angle of incidence. That is the angle from the, let's say the, the laser to this line, which is called the normal or perpendicular line to the reflecting surface. Once it reflects off of that reflecting surface, it's gonna come back out on the other side and at an angle that is actually equal to the angle of incidence. This angle is known as the angle of reflection to which then there's somebody on the other side that would see that. So when you have a radio frequency wave, a electromagnetic wave reflecting off of a surface, this is the same thing that will happen. Refraction. So this is the phenomenon that causes the bending of the radio wave when it passes from one medium to another medium of different densities. 
And you could probably guess what is this medium that's gonna have a different density, and that is the layers of the ionosphere. They have different densities. So a wave passing through the atmosphere at constant speed enters a dense layer of charged ions, which would be one of those layers in the ionosphere, which causes refraction or bending. Diffraction. This is a phenomenon where a radio wave bends around the edge of a solid object. So most commonly, we would see a mountain, and you would have a transmitter. And the wave front will either get absorbed into the mountain, or just above it, the wave front will actually slightly bend over it. And if everybody's ever taken a laser pointer and pointed it right at a very sharp edge, you will notice this effect. The, the effect of diffraction where it will slightly bend over the top and, and you'll no, notice that part of that laser uh, beam will be slightly uh, diffracted downwards from where you would expect it to hit so try that sometime but the same thing with radio waves in fact with vhf communications if you have a mountain in between you and the other person you're trying to speak with you could actually bend back that antenna that vertical polarized antenna back from the mountain and the wave front will be aimed at such a manner to which you could potentially get diffraction to help get that signal back down the other side to speak with somebody on on the opposite end of the mountain try it sometime waves traveling in straight lines bend around these obstacles so the energy is weak though detectable unless you're in the complete shadow zone so this concept explains why radio waves can be heard behind tall mountains or buildings that are normally considered a block line of sight transmissions. Fading. Variety of factors. So we have absorption fading, where let's say there's increased absorption in the D layer builds up during the morning hours, or we're going to talk a little bit later about solar flares where the D layer gets heavily ionized and also absorbs almost all signals. We have multipath fading. I alluded to this earlier where you would have either a direct wave and then a ground reflected wave where the signal is out of phase by 180 degrees in which when they recombine, they can potentially cancel each other out. That's multipath fading. And then you can also have uh, selective fading as well where you have two different paths to get there at almost two different times and then that can cause some issues in the receiver. So let's do a check on learning. Which layers of the ionosphere disappear at night? We have the D and E layers. Well, they will disappear. And then the F1 and F2, they don't disappear, but they combine into the F layer at night. What percentage below the maximum usable frequency is the optimum working frequency? 15%. And if you said somewhere between 15 and 25%, you're right too. What causes bending of a radio wave? So again, not reflection, because that doesn't bend it. That straight reflects it, but refraction and diffraction bends radio waves. And finally, what two factors are the most critical when engineering any radio system? And I said this at the very beginning of the presentation. Antenna and frequency. Those two things, those two factors will dominate every time you go out in the field. So this brings us to our last part of this presentation. It's effects of solar activity on communications. In particular with HF, all of these have huge impacts. Solar winds, sunspots, yes, they're a thing. The solar cycle for the sunspots every 11 years. Solar flares, coronal mass ejections. I'm gonna hit the sunspot cycle real quick. You're gonna see in the lower image there where it looks periodic. You have a solar cycle going on every 11 years, just about. And depending any given 11 years that go by, just how strong it's going to peak out at. In fact, in the 19, just before the 1960s, uh, it was just a heyday for for amateur radio. We had almost 200 sunspots. And what did that? What does that mean? Well, sunspots allow more ionization of those layers, meaning better propagation conditions. When the solar cycle is at its minimum, well, things are not that good. We can still communicate, kind of, but it's just not as good as it used to be, right? So 
what we're going off of is solar cycle 24 and solar cycle 25 is starting to pick up but right now we're looking at anywhere between seven to maybe 15 sunspots maybe less right now each day uh, as of september 2018 but it's only going to get better so just stick with it especially if you just got into hf and you're wondering what's going on well it's going to get it's just going to get better until it goes back down again another 11 years right so solar wind the solar wind is a stream of charged particles ejected from the upper atmosphere of the sun. It consists mainly of electrons and protons, and the stream of these particles varies in temperature and speed over time. They escape the sun's gravity because their high kinetic energy and high temperature allow them to escape. So think about that. The sun's gravity is absolutely intense, and so these particles are actually leaving it. I mean, think about what it took to get the Saturn V rocket to escape our own gravity so these these, these particles are I got a lot of energy behind them sunspots are temporary phenomena on this photosphere of the sun that appear visibly as dark spots why are they dark well this is the intense magnetic activity and these uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections originate in magnetically active regions around these visible sunspot groupings could we say that there's more solar flares when we have more sunspots Absolutely, that, that, that could absolutely be true. Solar flares, an explosion of the sun that happens when energy stored in twisted magnetic fields is suddenly just snaps and releases. Produces bursts of radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to X-rays and gamma rays. And so we have three classes of solar flares. We have the X-class. These are their big major events that can trigger planet-wide radio blackouts. We have M-class or medium size that can cause brief radio blackouts. And then finally, our C-class, which a few noticeable consequences. Coronal mass ejections. This is what pretty much keeps a lot of us up at night. Uh, concern that this ever is to happen. The way it did back in 1859, you, you think to yourself, oh, there, there wasn't the electronics that we had. Well, back then there was telegraphs. And the, the reports that I understood was that most of the batteries that were connected to the telegraph system, because that's how they were powered, uh, ended up... Um, not working anymore. So the, this was actually observed by two gentlemen independently, Richard Carrington and Richard Hodgson. Uh, it's the most powerful coronal mass ejection ever observed. And anything else that is as the same as intensity of the 1859 solar storm is known as a Carrington class solar event. So if you ever hear about a Carrington class solar event about to happen, I would just disconnect everything right then and there. Uh, it has the potential to inflict widespread power outages. So what have we seen in the past? Well, 1989, we experienced nothing quite the scale of a Carrington class, but the city of Quebec had a uh, rolling black power outage blackouts that happened. And then in 2012, there was a Carrington class solar event that missed us. It, it was uh, far ahead of our orbit. So fortunately, that does not happen. Flare effects. And I alluded to this earlier, but when we have a flare, there's x-rays from the flare site. When they get to our, our ionosphere, the D region will absolutely um, be heavily ionized by that flare effect. And that's not good because this is the uh, layer of the ionosphere that's closest to the Earth. If that gets heavily ionized, it will actually absorb most HF radio waves. And if that happens, well, we're going to get severe fading of our signal. So that's also not good when that happens. And that's a temporary uh, phenomenon that happens. So what can we do about it? Well, space weather. And we can actually look up what is the space weather for today. So if you want to annoy your Intel officer during, to make them want to brief this as well on top of normal weather, go for it. But there is a website. It's swpc.noaa.gov that will allow you to see what the conditions are. It will also give a forecast of what may be coming in the next three days or and also for, I think for gamma rays, it will go out almost 27 days. So you can also look at the same website, but then look at noaa-scales.explanation to actually figure out what the scales are all about. The variations again in the ionosphere, you have regular and irregular, so predictable daily just caused by the rotation of the earth we know what the layers of the ionosphere are going to do in a 24-hour period we also have seasonal where we have uh, the north and south progression of the sun 
So depending on heavy, more heavy ionization in the north versus the south, depending on which way the Earth's tilted, 27 days. Did you know that the sun rotates on its axis every 27 days? And so that rotation of the sun and the way in the sunspots that are on it, depending on what side of the sun we get, there's 27 day rotation. And then finally, sunspot activity. We know that every 11 years, we are going to go to almost no sunspot activity to a maximum. And then re irregular would be your coronal mass ejections and your flares. There's just no way to predict those. They just happen. Variables to HF usage. I'm going to keep hitting it again. Antenna and frequency, followed by power, location, time of day, and then if we have solar flares or sunspots. Join us for our next episode on military HF history. If you like this, please hit the like button and also subscribe if you're not already subscribed.